Okay, so now let's take some of this and put it to work. You are a royal family of God. You kind of know that by now. You have a lifetime of impressions about Christ, God, being a good Christian, the Bible. And there's a fair amount of discomfort how to live out that life, what it actually is, and what people say about it. And then there's a problem of just every time you go to read the Bible, I don't know about you, but when I'm reading it in English, I want to go to sleep within five and a half seconds. It's doggone there, well, impossible to read. You can't read it. It kills me when people talk about this. I read through the whole Bible. Honey, you didn't read it. You fell asleep in two and a half seconds. It's not possible to read the Bible like you do a novel just not too many things that aren't said that you have to study before you can read the text it's like walking into the middle of a movie unless you know a lot of the backstory you don't understand what you're reading okay and whatever you think you understand you're misusing that being said even once you start to understand it. There are some real problems there. And of course the atheist and the agnostic and, and you know the Muslim. Somebody of some other denomination that isn't yours. Are going to take those things and say well see. Yeah. You got to kind of you know. On the surface, it looks like they're right. Like Christ said, he excoriated people who were rich and didn't take care of the poor. But he also said, the poor you will have with you always, but you won't always have me. So he's saying that skip the poor and pay attention to him. That sounds kind of arrogant, doesn't it? God giving all that money to Abraham. Money spread it around. Gave all that money to David. Why didn't he spread it around? Okay. Why were there slaves in Israel? And there were. You know, typical atheist who doesn't know how to read Exodus 21. It's got to make a big stink about that. Well, there was slavery in, in Israel. In fact, Jacob himself enslaved himself to Laban in order to get a wife. And he ended up getting two. He was supposed to only work for seven years in order to get Rachel. And oops, it's Leah! The guy didn't even know who he slept with on the wedding night? It tells you how dumb he was. Oh, okay, so now you also get Rachel now, immediately, actually. That's not too easy to tell in translation. But you gotta work another seven years. So 14 years of slavery that he contracted to do. That tells you something about what the word slavery means in the Bible. It's a contract that you voluntarily choose. We don't call that slavery today. But it's translated that way. Servant. Slave. Oh. Yeah. So when the Bible says slavery, you better figure out if it's the same kind of slavery you think today back then. Because back then it had to do with employment contracts. The only thing that the Bible called slavery the way we call slavery was when you were kidnapped and that was punishable by death. The kidnapper was supposed to be punished with death. 
And that's in Exodus 21 or 22. I forget exactly where. It says kidnap. Okay, but that still, still, the word slavery is there. And it really does have that meaning. You contracted yourself and the person could kill you if you disobeyed until your term of indenture was over. But it was something you contracted to do. But once you contracted to do it, yeah, they could kill you. It's like court martial today. Well, what about that? Why did God allow that? And you've got other things that are not so easy to explain away, like how come some guy picking up sticks on the Sabbath gets the death penalty? Yeah. And then here's one that'll just kill the pro-lifers. Numbers 527. God orders abortion. There's no getting around that. I did videos on that. Episode 9 of the Pro-Life Blasphemy series. Okay, starting with 9A PB. I showed you the text live and I showed you the translator reaction. God orders an abortion? Now, why is there this I didn't want to call it problematic. Set of verses which are in the hundreds, if not thousands. Of verses that don't seem very godlike or very loving. And yet, at the same time, you have verses like. The valley will be made high and the mountain will be made low. And we all go, oh, goody, goody, goody. All those rich, nasty people are going to get put down. Because we're really the ones who are greedy. And, and, and we who are low, and we didn't work as hard as they did, so we don't have as much money, but we're going to overlook that. We're going to just say, well, they're rich and we're poor, so, they, so it's their fault that we're poor. And so we're going to look at the valley made high and the mountain made low. And we're going to be patting ourselves on the back. So then when the rest of the verses don't agree with our interpretation of that, well, then we're pretty upset. Jesus doesn't love me. This isn't the Bible that I knew. You, 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 this isn't... This can't be really the word of God. Or there's no God. You know, we, we've all gone through that. So now look. At some point in your life, from the time you were little, you came to realize that your parents weren't perfect. Sometime in your life, you came to realize that your parents make mistakes and they told you some stuff that's bad. But they told you it was true and it's not true. And at some point in your life, the standards that you grew up with, you found out that, oh, people don't live up to those standards. Oh, you are mean to me. Mm -hmm. And at some point in your life, you come to realize that the Bible isn't black and white either. Now, that's an integration also. How do you go from childish, good, bad, do, don't, black and white, 100% versus negative 100%? How do you go to the nuance? Well, the first thing you have to start to do, and it's not easy, is you have to start to realize that, that it's like real estate. There are boundaries. A thing is good up until X, and then it becomes bad. It's like fruit. It ripens, and then if it keeps on going, it over-ripens and turns rotten. 
The same thing is true with everything in life. Okay, there is a certain ripeness to a thing. That's why you can't just throw money at the poor and have it work. They have to be ripe for it. You have to do a right thing in a right way at the right time for the right person and only for a short window. You miss that window, ain't gonna work. It's like, you know, aiming at a basket in basketball. You can see the basket from clear across the court. But that's not gonna mean you're gonna hit it. If you get the if you get the ball in the wrong way with the wrong spin, I don't care how good you are, you are not gonna be able to twist your body in time to time that shot up high enough with enough loft at the distance and have it hit the basket. Even if you know how to do it, your body and everything else has to be working in exactly the right way. In other words, it always has to be something of a perfect storm for anything to work. Even when you turn on your faucet, there are a thousand things that can go wrong so that water might not come out of your faucet or too much water will come out of your faucet or your whole shower might come tumbling down and because so many times you've done it in the past none of that happened you keep on thinking well the next time it's not going to happen either but that doesn't mean it won't because something could be ripening underneath the surface okay so now we come back to what seem to be Bible contradictions in this other thing, where the Bible says one thing that seems to be, oh, poor, poor, rah, 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 we'll defend the poor, we'll defend the poor. And then in the next breath, Christ says, don't throw your pearls before swine. Huh? Where's the love there? And oh, you go to hell if you don't believe in Christ. Where's the love there? See the point? So there's a boundary. When you love your body, if you really love your body, you're going to beat it up. It's not going to feel like love. It's not going to look like love. It's going to look like cruelty. When you spank your kids, it don't feel like love to them. When you spank your dog, when you wash your clothes, when you do some activity you don't like, that doesn't seem like love. When you're putting up with somebody that, that yeah, you actually do love, but you sure don't want to be around them at that moment. It is love, but it don't feel or play like love. That's a boundary. A thing is still true, but the behavior and the way the relationship, what do you want to call it, functions, is the opposite. Now that is something that a child just can't cope with. And many a child in Christ and many a child in life they never quite get over that transition that they need to get over with their parents or with authority or with society. They just can't get past something. And for each of us, it's different. Okay? Each of us has some part of us that is very childish and hanging on to we didn't adjust out of childhood it's going to hold us back in the spiritual life similarly in mass it holds back whole societies like you know a whole lot of countries really are still stuck with the tribal familial loyalty they don't know how to be loyal based on rule of law that's a maturation that has to occur. Once a society is concerned about rule of law, the principle of rule of law, 
then the actual law starts to mature. Not until then. Well, in the West, we've had a lot more time to mature in the whole concept of rule of law. And we've, you know, sort of, we've lost a lot of our maturation, but that's one thing where we're still, we're still sort of in unison on that. There ought to be a rule of law. The trouble where that shows our immaturity is that we're making too damn many laws. But the idea is that, is that it's not your tribal, you know, relationship. It's not whether you're my mother, my brother, my father, my sister, my cousin. It's not based on religion, relationship. But the integrity of behavior is based on some, as it were, abstract principle that transcends personal relationships tribal unity and this loyalty and that loyalty and religious loyalty and blah, blah 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 that's held the human race back for a very long time and it holds back most people now they're all too hung up on my brother my father my sister my nation my race my gender you know my religion as some kind of a loyalty tie if you really love God you shouldn't even be thinking like that it's what is the truth, what is not the truth. What is good for what the principal reasons are that you can objectively prove based on principles, not based on family ties. This is why the Arabs are so childish and so far behind, Muslims in particular. Islam is about the most childish thing that there is. And yet it talks about principle all the time. But if you read the Quran, you'll find out it's just all very arbitrary. Now, you you know, they'll, somebody who's not familiar with the Bible will turn around and open it up to some page and say, well, God talks like that too. And this is where you have to make the distinction. If you're talking to a child, you have to talk to a child the way a child is going to understand. Okay. The big difference with the Bible versus the Quran is that there's a lot behind it that is not at all childish. And once you're an adult, you can see what's behind it. Okay, there's no, there's nothing arbitrary or capricious about Scripture. But you have to be an adult spiritually before you can tell that. Otherwise, then all you can do is, you know, read the Ten Commandments and recite how David married Bathsheba and Solomon was the son. Okay, then you don't know nothing. But when you're older, it's like, well, why... Bathsheba and why was it Solomon and why this and why that and of course you begin to understand some of the deeper issues there and David's a really good case in point about some of the so called Bible contradictions okay David was made extremely rich but he was an adulterer in fact he made sure that Bathsheba's husband got killed because he had sex with Bathsheba while her husband was fighting a war that David should have been fighting. And so he calls the husband home to make him go in to his wife so that the kid born would seem to be of the husband. That didn't work because the husband was so loyal to David he slept in David's own quarters, well, you know, in the palace. David even got the guy drunk. And when that didn't work, he finally sent him back to the front and ordered his commander to make sure that the husband got into the wrong end of the fighting so the husband would die, and that happened. That's David. I mean, there's more to the story about all the things he did right and wrong. But those are pretty serious things. And this is the guy from whom Christ will come. I don't think your typical Christian really is taking much appreciation of that. They're so hung up on morality. Honey, Christ is descended from an adulterer and a murderer. On purpose. By promise. By contract. From God himself as God actually. 
to David in 2 Samuel 7. It wasn't like he was forced to do it. He made the promise to David after all this had ended. Maybe not after it ended, but he foreknew it was going to happen. He makes the promise. Second Samuel 7 is when he made the promise. It was a unilateral promise. It didn't depend on David being a good boy. So, man, I mean, if you want to say that God's a bad person, or that there's, you know, just like seeing your parents, you know, you find out one day they're doing something that goes against the standards they taught you. Doesn't God seem to be going against the standards he's teaching us? Doesn't he teach us don't commit adultery? Doesn't he teach us do not murder? And yet he's going to he's going to have his gen, you know, his genetics come from a murderer and a, and a, and a, and an adulterer? Hmm. Isn't God being a hypocrite? So how do you integrate? Why does God do this? And how can you integrate all these disparate, opposing, contradicting Bible things? And why does God do that? The answer is real simple. It's ripeness. Now, that sounds simple. But how do you explain ripeness with David? Well, ripeness for what? See, here's a real point, and it's a killer, and it's really hard to live once you understand this. It doesn't matter how good David was. There was only one thing that mattered. David believed. He could have been an axe murderer, and damn near was. I mean, he's king, and he deliberately sets this guy up to get killed in battle where David should have been. To cover up the fact that he had sex with the guy's wife and now she's pregnant. Okay? I mean, that's a pretty big abuse of your power as a king. David was a mature believer. He was a king at this point. How are you going to reconcile similar things in your life? How are you going to reconcile these kinds of things in the Bible? How are you going to reconcile your own or somebody else's prosperity? Hmm? We all want to try to say that it's due to being good. It's not. And that, right on the face of it, seems terrifically immoral. David was blessed by God more than anybody else in the Old Testament. And of course, if he hadn't been blessed, we wouldn't have been. But you could have said, well, he could have blessed somebody else. And Messiah could come from someone else. Yeah. But David did something that others didn't do. He believed. And you can say, well, whoop de doo what's believing? There's no merit in that. That's right. There's no merit in my believing in God. There's nothing good about me. And if you're honest with yourself, you're going to say there's nothing good about you either. But God doesn't use what's good or bad about you. Romans 4. Thank you, God. Abraham might have something to boast about, but not before God. In other words, no matter how good you are, you're not as good as him. No matter how bad you are, it doesn't matter to him. You think, well, but that's immoral, isn't it? Well, did you ever stop to think that good and bad might have some other use? And um, what's that? Well, golly, do you drink gasoline? Well, no, brain out. That that's nasty. That's bad. That'll kill me. Yeah. So there's a real good reason not to do a bad thing. That has absolutely nothing to do with getting any kind of approval from God. I 
I mean, when was the last time you drank from a toilet? Never. I should, I mean, hopefully never. And why is that? Did you pat yourself on the back and say, Oh God, you should reward me for not drinking from the toilet? No. Okay, well then there's another reason to be moral, isn't there? Other than anything to do with God. And if you're moral, what does that have to do with God? Not a thing. It benefits you. It benefits the people around you. But don't benefit God. What benefits God is what God says benefits God. And what God says benefits God is believe in my son and you'll be forever saved. You don't want to do that? Fine. That's your problem. Now that sounds cruel, doesn't it? But, uh, hello? Do you want to just look at or manufacture or make an issue of the negative? How about the positive? All you do is believe. Okay, well that's nothing. There's no merit in believing, yeah. But it is something he wants. There's no accounting for taste. You can write all day or talk all day about how silly that is, but it's what he wants. Now, if you're the, providing a service to a customer and the customer wants it in red, you don't spend time saying how stupid red is. You give it to him in red. If you're the customer and you want it given to you in red, then they can sit there and say all day how stupid you are to want it in red but you want it in red and if they won't give it to you in red then you'll get it from somebody else God wants you to believe you can talk all day about whether or not that's a right criterion but it's his criterion believe and post-salvation, learn and live on Bible. And of course, you got to keep believing the Bible too. Which is, as I've been trying to show, kind of hard to do at times. But that's what he wants. And you can talk all day about how the Christian way of life ought to be being moral. But it's not. And that's the point that God's making with all these contradictions in the Bible. Whenever you see a contradiction in the Bible, just sit up and pay attention. He's making a point. They're there on purpose. Every little jot and tittle. Christ who said, don't put your pearls, doctrine, before swine, people who aren't going to accept it. They'll just trample it in the ground. Okay. So it means you don't go knocking on doors, sharing. If God wants somebody to get it from you, he'll send that person to you. That way that person knows he did the sending, not you. And you'll know he did the sending. And that's what you really need to know because then obviously your first question is going to be, okay, what do I say now? So that at all points, it's vertical first, horizontal second. It's like those two legs, the inverted V. So up to God, and then from God down to the other person. That means that God is always the nexus. That means that everybody's looking at him first. And that, that just relieves everything in relationships with people in life. Okay, but that's a boundary too. The normal human thought pattern is Joe Blow walks up to Jane Doe and everybody thinks, well, you're looking eye to eye at each other. There's no God there in between. Okay, so now you, the, the ripe opportunity, the ripeness is look up. Not lateral, look up. What's the doctrinal principle not the tribal, horizontal, human li line or linkage or relationship. That was a mistake Adam made. He should have looked up instead of at his wife. So you look up. What's the principle here? What am I learning? This is Bible class. What am I supposed to say? 
And that's going to seem like to you and if the other person ever figures it out, that's going to seem like cool or cruel. Cool as in cold. Cruel as in nasty. That you're looking up to God first. Why can't you look at me? But honey, if I don't look at him first, then I don't care about you. Real love is to look at him first. What? A, thank you. What did John say? You can't be loving your fellow man if you're not loving God. Now, John actually phrases it as, if you're hating your brother, you can't be loving God. And everybody blindly thinks that means, oh, well, see, if, you love, if I love you, then I love God. But think about what he had said in the context. If you love God, then you're in fellowship with God. If you're not in fellowship with God, who you can't see, then you cannot be in fellowship with man who you can see. What you are instead is that you're, you're putting the cart before the horse. You're operating horizontally. See, that's a, that's a boundary line. That's a contradiction. It's not really a contradiction. It's a boundary line. It's like, what direction do you go? This is like the difference between saying, don't throw your pearls before swine and valley will be exalted. The poor you will have with you always, which sounds very condescending. But the poor you really will have with you always. They don't want to learn Bible doctrine. They want to live horizontally. They don't want to go vertical. In any occupation in life, if you're going to have, you know, if you're going to make money, truly make money rather than, you know, illicitly, and maybe even if it's illicit, you've got to work really hard and you've got to spend a lot of time alone. That's equivalent to vertical. You got to work really hard and spend a lot of time alone, thinking, studying, planning, practicing, whatever it is you got to do. And the people who are lateral around you are going to resent that. Well, you should have been with me. How come you're coming home at nine o'clock at night? Were you with a floozy? No, you were working so that you could make more money for your spouse, who's now nagging you to death, and you're tired. So what do you say? You don't say anything. You just try to go to sleep. And after, you know, four or five years of that, you keep thinking, well, it'll get better once I get the money. You finally get the promotion or the money or whatever, and now your spouse, spouse sees that the money is there, and she wants a divorce. Well, that's how much love you received for all the trouble you went to. So if you'd have been living vertically during that time, even if she wants a divorce, at least you got Bible doctrine out of it. And maybe she doesn't want to divorce you either. Because maybe her seeing you learn and live on Bible makes her want to learn and live on it too. Not necessarily going to happen. <laughs> I wish I could say that was the norm, but it's not... Norm is for the spouse to just get more and more disgruntled. But at least you didn't waste your time. You lived vertically and made your money and kept on hoping things would get better at home and they don't, but now you got the money and you got a whole bunch more Bible on top of it. And she leaves you and you wait a couple of years because it's never good to remarry immediately. And then God will bring in the right person into your life. <laughs> or nobody. Because now you just want to be married to him. Okay, well that seems like a contradiction too. You see the point? Why? 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 Well, one of the whys is to learn all these twists and turns. Because we really are going to have a poor with us always. That's the hard news. But once we're all dead, 
Everybody's favorite topic is going to be scripture. And the would have beens and could have beens and whatever it is that we're doing in the eternal state to show him off. We're all going to be very busy doing that and very anxious to see anybody else who's doing that. And it's going to be number one topic and we're never going to get tired of it. And then we'll all have harmony. Why? Because it's vertical first. Because that's the way we're all going to want it. It's just that most people are going to have like little straws of vertical relationship with God. And the kings will have these huge super highway pipelines of vertical relationship to God. And then all the straws stick themselves into the pipeline, so to speak. And they each get their little slurp of doctrine for the day. Oh, my slurp tastes so good. And then they all talk with each other about what they learned. And you'll be sitting there at the top of the, you know, the pipeline. Like a parent. With all your little kitties. Thousands and thousands of kitties. And as far as, you're, as, far as they're concerned, you're a god to them. But you see how happy they are. And yes, it's a little drop per person because that's their poor. That's all they can tolerate. But they're happy. They're happy they're happy and you do it tomorrow and the next day and the next day and every day is a little drop more and a little drop more and they're bigger and bigger and growing bigger and bigger and bigger and yes it's very slow because eternity lasts a long time but now you really are like God and you just want to throw your life down for God ultimate parenting I make it sound good don't I to me, this is a very definition of hell and the very definition of contradiction and ripeness, huh? Ta-ta!